Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadvent. Joining me is our sometimes co-host, Alec Krauthammel. Uh Alec, you were on the call today for WRSU. Huge, huge win for Rutgers basketball. They dominated number 11, Wisconsin. They won 78-56, to I believe. It's the largest win by Rutgers over a ranked team in school history. Just... I was at the game. You were at the game. Just what are you, your your initial thoughts on this huge victory for Rutgers basketball? I mean, it was just pure domination, and it wasn't totally on the defensive end, which is what many people thought coming in, especially given the struggles that Rutgers has had putting the ball in the basket. I mean, they were a juggernaut offensively, 10-7 to 7 from three. I don't think that's happened since Seton Hall when they shot 50%. That was 59%. They made their free throws. They didn't get to the line as much. They shot 45% from floor. Wisconsin only shot 33. It was just pure domination uh, from Rutgers on both ends of the floor. They really rattled Wisconsin, and they—they, they, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to see that because Wisconsin is they're a well-coached team. Uh, they're coming in off three-game losing streak, and I mean, thought maybe this would be some kind of a revival game for them. But I mean, the skid continues for them, and now for Rutgers, you've won three straight games. You know, at Michigan, at Maryland, and then you come home and play Jersey Max Arena and dominate a top 15 team. I mean, people are talking postseason now. Maybe NIT, and I know we were talking about this off the pod, but you know, maybe there's a some sort of pipe dream to getting on the bubble or whatever, and for once, going to Dayton would be a godsend. And you know, <laughs> I, I guess we'll see, but I, things are purely pointed up right now. They certainly have the opportunity <laughs> to make their, their resume a lot more uh, appetizing. They have three more quad one opportunities uh, at Purdue, at Wisconsin, and at Nebraska. They've got uh, two quad one games uh, at home versus Northwestern, home versus Ohio State, and they got two more quad three games, uh, home game versus Maryland, home game versus Michigan. I see five wins on that schedule at least. I mean, they have four more uh, home games. So, I mean, postseason I think is – is almost a lock at this point. Assuming they don't go on another tailspin, the NIT, given their new rules about not having to take conference regular season champions anymore, it's going to be a lot more uh, high major schools. So I do think the NIT at minimum uh, is kind of the expectation right now. Um, but I do feel like this game, it's almost like, you remember that scene in Space Jam where they, you know, the Monstars all, you know, all the, the NBA players have the, their, their talent sucked out through the basketball. And the next time they go on the court, they're like basically like you and I getting onto the court. That's what Ohio, that's what Wisconsin looked like. It looked like Rutgers stole all their powers because they're pretty good at shooting threes. They're good at free throws. And Rutgers was just a team possessed today. I know we've talked about the impact Jeremiah Williams has had. Um, I just think having his kind of personality out there helps a ton. You know, he's clearly the leader of this team. He creates so much like easy spacing and easy shots. Like even when we would get down into like, you know, three or four seconds left on the shot clock and you kinda have to force something, we were still getting good looks today, despite, you know, having to come into these pressure situations in the past. Like if you had less than five seconds on the shot clock for Rutgers in like most of the season, you were just throwing a brick at the rim. Uh, today was not the case. We just had so much easy offense today. So much so many of our shots were just in rhythm. It just felt like this was the team that Steve Peichel had in mind when he kind of got this roster together. They did play with a ton of tempo, and like you said, the shots fell. And sometimes it, it's just as simple as that. The shots were falling today, and you got to hope this momentum just continues on because vibes are high. I saw people like like Big Ten writers and national people saying, "Is Jeremiah Williams on Rucker? Like, is Rutgers with Jeremiah Williams the third best team in the Big Ten? And right now, I don't know if that I don't know if you could argue against it. They're playing like one of the best teams in, in the Big Ten. Their record might not indicate that, but I think this is a very very good team right now. I think if they had Jeremiah Williams from the start, this would be a without a doubt tournament team with at least two more wins on the schedule. But you know. If your you know, aunt had a dick, she'd be your uncle, so you can't really look at the, the schedule like that. But still, this team is playing at a really high level at the time of year where you want to start you know, peaking and getting into form, and Rutgers is certainly doing that. Yeah, and I think that's kind of like the staple of these Steve Peichel teams too. It feels like January is kind of like a, I don't want to say a trial run, but at least in Big Ten play, it always seems like they're missing something. and. You know, they'll always have a bad loss at the end of January after putting together some, some wins, you know. But then February is yep. where they really ramp it up. And you know, getting Jeremiah Williams is obviously a boost. It, it, at least to me on offense, it looks like him and Cliff Amore have been playing with each other for four years. 
yeah, and the chemistry yeah. that those two have, I asked both of them about it after the game, and they said, yeah, it's just a lot of practicing. Jeremiah has been the leader, like you said, on this team. And Steve Peichel talked about it as well. His personality, like you said, is just, I mean, he's hes not afraid of the moment. Um, just his ability to get downhill and get to the rim is, he can just break down his man. I know we talked about Derek Simpson and his ability to do that too, but it feels like Jeremiah Williams, it feels like he's so much more in control and more consistent yes. at getting to the rim too. And it's just his, his impact cannot be overstated. And I, I feel like, Rutgers being considered the third best team in the Big Ten with Jeremiah Williams is more of an indictment on the Big Ten this year than a yeah, you know, compliment at Rutgers. Fair. But, I mean, either way, there's some winnable opportunities down the stretch. And, you know, while even if they don't make the NCAA tournament, there can still be a lot of goodwill coming into next year off of, yeah. say, a successful NIT run or something like that. Yeah, deep run in the NIT, it, it'll battle harden these guys. It'll get them in, you know, must win games, and you, that's what the NCAA tournament is. You don't want to have your first time for the majority of the team uh, being in the NCAA tournament, being led by two freshmen, even if they are, you know, these uber talented guys who are likely top five in NBA draft picks. You still would like to have the rest of the team kind of cocooning around them to let their talents flourish and not be super reliant on them. Um, so many guys today just had standout performances. It's tough to say, like, one guy or the other. Uh, you mentioned Cliff. He almost had a triple-double today with blocks. He had 13, uh, 13 points, 13 rebounds, and 8 blocks. And it felt like, you know, sometimes you look at his box score and you're like, holy crap, he had this many, or wow, they didn't have, he only had this many. It felt like he had 8 blocks. Every time it seemed like Wisconsin was going into the paint when he was on the court, Cliff was affecting a shot or blocking the shot. Like, Cliff was fantastic today. He took a few of those, you know, patented Cliff, like, back down, turn around shots in the paint. But anything that was around the rim he was making today, I thought Cliff was fantastic. Yeah, I agree with that. And, I mean, it just feels like everything is clicking around him right now. Where it doesn't feel like – he'll definitely force some shots, but it doesn't feel like a complete chore every time he gets the ball and puts up a shot like it was maybe earlier in the season. and. I mean, to talk about Jeremiah Williams again, that's a big part of what he does as well because he commands so much defensive attention because not only can he drive, he can dish it really well too. And he found him a few times, including that lob at the beginning of the game. And I guess one, I can't believe we haven't even talked about him yet, but how about Noah Fernandez? 17 oh points, God. perfect 6 of 6 from the floor, 5 of 5 from 3. Felt like every 3 he made was in rhythm a couple feet from beyond the arc. It was just unbelievable. Yeah, and two of two of those threes were definitely like bailout shots at the end of the shot clock where he was probably three or four feet behind the line. He was incredible today. And I'm so happy for Noah because we have collectively kind of left him for dead a bit. Um, he has struggled mightily. I feel like the whole team has struggled because it's been like a bunch of it's been a bunch of pieces to the puzzle but we haven't had like the picture to know what the puzzle's supposed to look like. I feel like Jeremiah Williams is like flipping the lid of the, the puzzle box and you're like, oh, these are where all these pieces are supposed to go. It's just so much more clear. Everything just kind of makes sense with him on the court. And you're right. Noah Fernandes today, we don't win that game without him because he was, every time it seemed like Wisconsin would get the game closer, like within, you know, and it wasn't even close most of the second half, but, you know, there was a few really nice design plays for Wisconsin in the second half where they would get a wide open three and they make it. And it seemed like Noah Fernandes had an answer for that two or three times. So uh, he was just a huge spark plug off the bench. Andre Hyatt was also a spark plug off the bench. He, I mean, it, it just seemed like guys had their shots today. Noah Fernandes was at the top of the key threes. Andre Hyatt, it was corner threes. He was just shoot. He was getting everything in rhythm and, and shooting confidently. And it's great to see him, you know, back, you know, with some swag because we really need a guy like Andre to be that kind of go get a basket type guy when we need it outside of, you know, Jeremiah Williams. Uh, he was incredible today. It just, it was so many guys who had really good performances. I'm, I feel like I'm being hyperbolic saying incredible, but they really were incredible today. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the other guy to score in double figures is Moat Mag. Even he had some really good shots as well. He had that three in the corner later on, six rebounds. He did unbelievable job on the defensive end. I mean, yeah, the, the defense. That was what a lot of people thought would show up today. Uh, it's definitely been overshadowed by the offense, but absolutely perfect game plan by Steve Peichel and his staff. He credited T.J. Thompson after the fact with the scouting. I mean, they just did not let Wisconsin do pretty much anything easily enough. The pressure was there. Greg Gard said, you know, he was very disappointed with how much more aggressive what Rutgers was than Wisconsin, especially when it came to the pressure on defense. 
Yeah, no, they they looked broken by the time the second half rolled around. Like they just looked like nobody really wanted the ball in their hands. They weren't getting anything in rhythm on their offensive end. They just every time they tried to seemingly make the extra pass, Rutgers was getting an arm in there, even if it wasn't a, you know a steal. They were just getting the ball deflected out of the way. Rutgers, I don't know what it is, but if you watch like a few of the early games. And you watch guys trying to, to switch off defenders. You guys, you see guys trying to fight through screens. It just seemed like they didn't really know what they were doing, especially a guy like Michael Davis and Gavin Griffiths. These guys know what they're doing now. They do not, you know, leave a wide open, uh, you know, cutter because a guy, you know, missed a, a defensive rotation. There is everything is playing. It's kind of like a, a hive of bees out there. They're all in cohesion. They're all. You know, they all have the whatever the pheromone trail is left on the court where they're supposed to go. They know exactly where they're supposed to be as a team at all times. And it's, it, it's defense can be ugly sometimes to watch, but the way Rutgers plays defense is just it's 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 a lot of fun to watch. I, I don't know how to better describe it. Yeah, I, I think the biggest key was that they were able to speed up Wisconsin and Wisconsin yep. for years and even decades now. They love to play it slow. They don't turn the ball over. They be, they're, they're methodical on offense. They get their own shots that they want, but Rutgers was able to speed them up. A lot of it thanks to that pressure. You know, A.J. Storr was really good in the first half. Uh, he had uh, was their only double-digit scorer coming in at the half, but then in the second half, he was nowhere to be found. 0-4 from the floor, only point came on a free throw. I mean, just the game plan that they came in with, I mean, it was unbelievable the way that they were the pressure of ball handlers. Max Klesman was not good, 1-7 from the floor. Chucky Hepburn struggled. He didn't make a field goal either. I mean, just the way that they were able to lock down on some of these guys that have given Wisconsin so much value so far, and the reason why, you know, they're a top-20 ranked team, it's just they were able to shut them down. Crowell and Wall really couldn't do much at all either. And we already talked about Cliff Amore, his impact defensively. It just, I mean, nothing was doing offensively. And a big reason of why that was was because they had to speed up because the Rutgers' uh, defensive pressure just took them all out of sorts. and. Yeah, the fact that they were able to just limit all of these guys to just terrible performances, you know, it means that they can defend with anyone in the entire country. And they're second in Ken Palm right now in defensive efficiency. And it really does look like this is one of the five best defenses in the entire country. Yeah, they, you know, it was kind of strange to see that top 10 ranking for most of the season next to Rucker's name on, on these advanced analytics sites. Uh, because we just kind of were playing so poorly offensively. It just was kind of getting washed out. Um, but when you have a, an average offense even, that, that top defense, it stands out so much more because that's creating those transition points. It's creating those breakaway opportunities. And, you know, Rutgers, if you look at you know how well they passed today, they had 18 assists as a team. Wisconsin had seven. Wisconsin was just not getting anything – that even resembled good looks for most of the game outside of those couple uh, three-pointers I, I kind of mentioned earlier. I, I just can't believe they shot less than 60% as a team from the, from the line. They came in as one of the, I think, 25 best uh, free-throw shooting teams in the nation. I think they're shooting over 75% as a team. They also don't usually allow many offensive rebounds. Today, Rutgers had 10 offensive rebounds. So just credit all around, uh, just an all-around performance offensively defensively on the glass it just i there's too many superlatives there just it was so much that it was by far the best game of the season that Rutgers has played yeah absolutely and one of those last points you mentioned the offensive rebounds i feel like it's not being talked enough about just how much an improvement this this team has made on the rebounding department they were a terrible rebounding team you know you look yep. at Wake Forest Illinois where you get out rebounded almost doubled up on the rebounding game but I, they've just flipped the switch. The guards have done such a better job of crashing the glass. Cliff has really done a great job of improving his own positioning and getting in there for tough rebounds. Seems like his hands have improved too. You know, you know he'll yeah. drop a few here and there, like the, a bit of a fastball from Jeremiah Williams that he couldn't really handle. But it, the rebounding as a whole, I feel like it's not being talked enough about how much that's improved just within the season. I think it's a credit to Michael and the staff just honing in on that one main weakness and really doing their best to improve it. it looked, no matter what the lineup is, they're going to look better on the boards, I think, so far. And Cliff was in there for a ton of rebounds as well. Um, he's just, I mean, the improvement on the glass, I think, is very, very apparent too. And I, I feel like that should be a pretty big talking point as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think Emmanuel Ogbo is starting to round into form as well, uh, especially on, on the glass. He, had, he, was only, he only played eight minutes today. 
He had three offensive rebounds, three of the team's ten. Uh, he also had a really nice assist when he was uh, backing down in, into the, the post. Um, he kicked it out to a wide open. I think it was Noah Fernandes for a three. Uh, he's, you know, the first game he played, I think, against Michigan was really rough. Last game against Maryland, I thought he looked better. Today, he looked much better. So that's very encouraging. It's kind of surprising uh, some of the minute distributions that are kind of starting to, to form on this team. Michael has really tightened up his rotations. Uh, another game where uh, Antoine Wolfolk doesn't see any minutes. Another game where Oscar Palmquist doesn't see any minutes. Um, Pike typically plays, you know, seven to eight guys in his rotations when uh, crunch time rolls around. And it was weird to see so many guys on the court uh, even midway through the season. I think that just kind of goes to show they were trying anything to see if the, the, the combinations would work and Jeremiah Williams was that, that picture of the puzzle that we just needed, and everything makes sense now. Yeah, absolutely. And it does take the pressure off. Well, the additions of Abole and uh, and, Jim, and Jer- Jeremiah Williams, I can't believe I almost forgot his name. Um, th- those additions, <laughs> it, it takes the pressure off of some of those other guys as well. You know, Noah Fernandes, he doesn't have to be that main ball-dominant guy. He can be more of a spot-up guy that he showed today. Um, you know, Cliff Amore, now that he has two bigs behind him that are serviceable, um, I think it, it takes the pressure off of him as well. He doesn't have to completely worry about getting in foul trouble. Um, yeah, and I, I do think it'll just depend on the night for some of the some of these minute res- uh, the spreading out of some of the minutes because you know against Julian Reese in Maryland we saw a lot of Antoine Wolfolk and not as much Ogbole. Yep. And then you know Michigan and today against Wisconsin no Wolfolk and some Ogbole minutes as well. You know there's a bit of a log jam when you think about it. Cliff is going to log at least 30 minutes most nights. Um, yep. So how that works out, I, I think it's worked out pretty well so far. Um, I'm interested to see how it goes moving forward, so, and especially like you mentioned, this is a, a Rutgers program that oftentimes has relied on not a lot of bench help a, as well. Um, and the fact that you know you're getting some of those guys in, I, I think it can help the depth. And I'm interested to see where else the minutes distribution goes because. I don't know if Fernandes is going to shoot six to six from the floor in 18 minutes every single game, or you know, Gavin Griffiths. <laughs> he might have some other games where you know he's shooting the ball better than he did today. So it's kind of like a a lot of moving pieces still to be ironed out. But they're playing well right now, and the starting five is playing very well right now as well. So I think you can kind of experiment a little bit more with some of these guys. You know, maybe stagger some guys in minutes here and there, or something like that. So yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out down the stretch. Um, it, I mean, it goes back to when Peichel said this is his deepest team at Rutgers. Uh, I don't know if that was totally true, but, I mean, it seems like if things are firing on all cylinders, they have more pieces off the bench than they did in years past that can actually, like, really contribute. Yeah, definitely. And I think the last kind of piece to this uh, this rotation puzzle is once Gavin Grissett starts figuring things out, and I, I think he will, this team is going to look even that much more dangerous uh, because he is clearly a guy that they want to get going. They they've kept they continue to draw up plays out of inbound passes for him. Uh, once he gets his his full confidence back, I I, I do think it's going to be a scary team. Um, am I crazy to think that like you know Rutgers is three wins in a row away from being actually a tournament team like? Because the next three games for Rutgers, they play Northwestern on Thursday at home. They play at Minnesota on the 18th, which I think is the uh, either is it next uh, Sunday? That's uh, next Saturday. Uh, so they play. Uh, no wait, that's May. Jesus, wrong wrong month. Okay, yeah, so they Minnesota play on Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, they play Sunday night at Minnesota, and then they go uh, on the road to Purdue. So obviously that's a very tough game, but if they win. Let's say let's say they win two in the next three. They win Northwestern and at Minnesota, uh, is and then they, they play Maryland and Michigan. So let's say they go four and one in the next five. That'll put them at uh, seventeen and eleven. They're very much on the bubble there. Like that is square as square on the bubble as you can be uh, to go seventeen and eleven through twenty eight games in the Big Ten. And I don't think it's that crazy to think that's possible either. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree. I mean, Northwestern's going to be a tough team, as always. They marched into Jersey Mike's Arena last year and clamped down on the Scarlet Knights. That was in the middle of their free fall. 
uh, Minnesota, Williams Arena. Weird stuff always happens at Williams Arena. Yeah, but this it does. year, I mean, this year there's the advantage of it, it is not a complete landmine game, and Minnesota is actually like a serviceable team this year. So it, I don't, I don't really know if that means anything for the result itself. But at the very least, you know, if they were to fall in that game, then it's not the complete end of the world. I believe that would probably still be a quad two game on the road if they lose. Um, winning at Purdue, I, if, if you win at Purdue, um, I think you clinch NIT at the very least, and then you get people really talking about, you know, what can Rutgers do here? And it feels like those last two potential landmine games are Maryland and Michigan at home, uh, both of those on the 25th and the 29th. It's kind of interesting. They already announced uh, today that Maryland is going to be the blackout game, but it's a noon tip off, so that's a little interesting. Yeah. I mean, either way, I think I still think the blackout game is going to bring a great environment. Um, Absolutely. But either way, I mean, yeah, if they go four and one in the stretch, and the loss either comes uh, against Northwestern, Minnesota, or Purdue, I think if they lose to Maryland or Michigan at home, I think you can kill the NCAA tournament dream. But I mean, yep. if they beat Michigan and Maryland, and they go three and one in the other, th- or two and one in the other three games, I mean, you could be looking at bubble talk, and then you got. You got to get two or three different rematch games. You go to Lincoln, Nebraska, which is especially this year is not easy place to win. That's at. that's gonna be a tough game. Yep. You go back to Madison to play Wisconsin again, which I mean, Rutgers has been able to walk into that building and win in years past. And then Senior Day, you host Ohio State. So I mean, it's all out in front of them right now, which you could not have said this time. I guess last month or even a couple of weeks, even heck, even last week, you could not have said that. So, yep. I mean, they're, they're starting to stack up wins, and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm starting to get back on the bandwagon. Andy Katz tweeted that the bus is back. I, I might have to hop it on is. it. I don't know. It, it, it looks good right now. Yeah, Rutgers has won three of their last four against uh, Wisconsin. They've won their last two games in Madison. So I don't think it's totally out of the, the, uh, the question to, to win there. Um, another thing that I think is interesting is uh, when they were talking about Last year, the justification for leaving Rutgers out of the tournament, a big reason was Mawat Mag was so important to this team. He gets hurt down the stretch. Even though they have the resume of a tournament team, that was kind of the deciding factor. Now, will the NCAA be uh, just and include Jeremiah Williams not playing with the team until halfway through the season? And, you know, seeing how much better of a team Rutgers is with Jeremiah Williams versus without him, I doubt it. But it is a strong case that... The athletic department might be uh, justified in, you know, beating that drum. You know how we, that was held against us last year. Why is that not getting, you know, added to our resume this year? I don't know. That's just the conspiracy theory, I guess. But. Yeah, I mean, obviously they should consider it. I mean, I know the NCAA selection committee it has nothing to do with the, you know, the uh, infractions committee or whatever the heck, but it was their own doing. So you know, yeah. it's kind of hard yeah. to hold it against them. But I mean. I just don't know if the resume is going to be enough. Um, granted, there still aren't that many bad losses. I don't know if there's any really bad losses so far. There, If they beat Purdue, then that's a signature win. But if they don't, then there's not really much of a signature win, especially if Wisconsin tumbles down the rankings like they probably will after they've lost four consecutive games. And I'm yep. looking at the schedule. like they, they have, for the most part, excluding today, obviously, they have won the games that I guess they quote-unquote should and they lost the games that they also should, I guess. I don't know. It's a very weird resume. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. If there's no signature wins and there's no totally bad losses, I don't really know how the committee is going to look at them. I, now, I, maybe yeah. we're too far ahead of ourselves, but, hey, I mean, the schedule, it's its there in front of them. Now we just have to see if they take advantage. Hey, this is this is what we talk about in Big Win po- Podcast. We go pie in the sky. Uh, when we lose big games like against Penn State, we talk about how you know we're dead in a ditch. Uh, but right now, I'm, I'm feeling the good vibes. I, I don't know. There's just something about this team with Jeremiah Williams that feels so much different than the first, what, 17 games without him. Um, Dylan Grant was at the game. He was a, a recruit that a lot of people have been asking about because he was playing for a team, I think Michigan Collegiate Academy or something like that. Uh, last year, he, he actually wasn't playing at all this year, and people were kind of wondering, you know, is he signed? Is he even real? Is he a real person? Uh, so it was nice to see him at a game, get a huge ovation. Uh, you always love to see recruits getting the love from the, 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 the fans and, and everyone at the arena. 
and it just shows like kind of the the av- the knowledge of the average Rutgers fan. They all knew who, for the most part, who Dylan Grant was, even despite the fact he was a you know lightly recruited guy who was Canadian and you know he moved to the U.S. this past year. And it was just nice to see him in person and to see him get that over. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, just showing just showing him what you can be excited about as well. Yeah, the crowd was absolutely rocking today. Um, even for a noon tip off, this I will say the students got were a little slow getting out of bed. You know, I'm a student. I was a little slow getting out of bed this morning as well at 8 a.m. to get ready for the broadcast. But I mean, once the once the game really started and everyone started to pack in, it was a fantastic environment. And one of the loudest moments, I, I guess, all year I would say, is when Noah hit that last three from as Brian Fonseca put it, he hit it from Edison. Uh, I think that might have been the, one of the loudest that one of the loudest moments the arena's had all season long. Um, yeah, the, the crowd was awesome. I mean, it was just it's hard to poke holes in anything that went on today. You know, you could nitpick, you could nitpick here and there. I mean, Derek didn't have a, unfortunately he didn't have a great game. He did hit a big three. Um, you know, Gavin Griffiths didn't have a great game either. But all in all, I mean, every it seems like everything went right today for Rutgers. Yeah, for sure. And I just thought of this now i don't know why i didn't bring it up earlier but this was the first home game jeremiah williams has ever played at Rutgers. he's played the first two games on the road so it must have been nice for him to finally you know after almost two years not playing to get a you know a, <clears throat> have a home crowd behind you while you're playing a basketball game um so that's kind of all i got alec did you have anything else that you wanted to, to talk about or hit on before we head out of here today um i mean i think we hit on everything you know look, i guess looking more at wisconsin like we talked about before, AJ Store was really good in the first half. Nothing going in the second half. Connor Sejan actually like was a pretty good spark plug off the bench for Wisconsin. His mm-hmm. roles kind of really diminished this year since Store and Klesmet and Hepburn have all been really good. But hey, uh, you know, props to Connor Sejan for stepping off the bench, hit some big threes, kind of just gave him a jolt in the arm. But you know, Rutgers kind of put that out quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've hit on everything. Um, crowd was great just like we talked about everyone pretty much everyone uh really did contribute you know we talked about Derek not having a great game still had five assists too so he's been that distributor yep. as well um unfortunately Rutgers women's basketball couldn't keep up the momentum they fell to Michigan out in Ann Arbor um pretty rough game for them my story will probably be out by the time this is published but <laughs> I mean so far you know I will say I'm about to go on a bit of a tangent here about the about the women's team because that's the team that I cover for rivals. But <laughs> it's it's unfortunate because a lot of times they'll play hard and really compete with some of these Big Ten opponents for you know three quarters, but then they have one quarter where they just can't get anything going. And sometimes it's the first, sometimes it's the third, sometimes it's the fourth. Unfortunately, today it was the first. There's talent on that team. They just gotta get healthy, bring in some some more play. It's as simple as they gotta bring in some more players too. Um, yeah. But I think the future is, is looking pretty bright, bright for both teams. But uh, yeah, that's I think that's uh, I think that's most of everything that I got. Pretty great day. Awesome day. Awesome crowd. Awesome weather. Couldn't ask for much more in, in the middle of February. Uh, thanks for for hopping on in here, Alec. And we're still doing our giveaway. So if you uh, want to get in on the gnome, uh, you can comment below. Just type something about a gnome. We'll enter you into the contest or leave a five-star review on your favorite podcasting platform mentioning gnome. Uh, For me and Alec, though, this has been another edition of the Night Report podcast signing off.